is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Fang. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com, where today we are getting you set for the quarterfinals of Euro 2020, breaking down all four matches and the futures market with Alex Heiner of NumberFire, getting his thoughts on those teams and what to expect this week. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com, joined here as always by Dr. Ed Fang. You can find his work over at the PowerRank.com and Ed, the round of 16 seemed pretty crazy. Got four matches coming up this weekend. How are you doing today? Uh, in general, I'm doing great. I've been uh, so obsessed with Euro. I've been fun watching a lot of these matches. I'm also in a little bit of mourning because Germany couldn't get it done against England. In fact, you know, that's hence the black, you know, black. Yeah, you're wearing a black here. Germany kit, kit right now. So it's yeah. uh, it covers all the bases at once. Yeah, and, uh, you know, they, they just did not play well against England uh, on the road at Wembley. I just I just don't think they played well, and they still had their chances, and they couldn't put them home. So, um, yeah, it's a little bit of a disappointment, but, uh, yeah, you know, and I also I also love the Dutch, too, and they also flamed out in that round, too. So, uh, But it's not going to make me enjoy the, the next couple games any less. So it's been a great tournament. Uh, Monday was an epic day with Spain, Croatia, and, and, and France, Switzerland. Um, and, I mean, sports doesn't get better than those five right. hours uh, during the well, middle yeah, of the Well, yeah, like, what was that like for you? Because you are, between the two of us, obviously, the big soccer slash football fan. And yeah. I got excited observing people being excited. So I can't imagine oh, what yeah. that would be like for people who actually really care about this stuff and really enjoy it. That must have been just absurd that whole day. Yeah, the whole, the whole day was great. I mean, I wanted to watch Spain-Croatia. I had over two and a half goals. So uh, watched it with pretty, you know, and I, I like Spain a lot. I mean, uh, definitely an, an over team uh, with the way I see their numbers and uh, their second best offensive team in, in, in the world uh, when I run my numbers. And uh, what? what? Oh, there was a crazy own goal that happened right in the first half. Like, so the Spanish defender kicks it back to his keeper and he just completely flubs it and the ball goes into the net. One nothing Croatia. Um and uh, Spain ended up scoring twice, so I'm like, oh, great, over 2-1. Uh, right. So it was 2-1 Spain in about the 70th minute, and I was like, all right, well, I want to watch part of the later game, and I got a phone call in a sec here, so I'm going to go for my run now. So I leave, come back to see that the final was Spain 5-3 in extra time, Yeah, <laughs> which is just nuts. Uh, Spain ended up scoring again. Croatia scored twice in regulation. Spain scored twice in extra time. Just insane. Like, that, yeah. that, doesn't, that doesn't really happen. No. <laughs> like ever um and then uh come back i had a phone call then come back and uh you know i saw, see that switzerland's up one nothing at halftime turn it on a little bit after that and you know france is the was the betting favorite right and and rightfully so with with the way they played and, and with their background and and switzerland was up one nothing they have a penalty kick as soon as i turn it on and so switzerland is looking great Switzerland gets uh, stoned on the penalty kick, and then France does France things and scores three gorgeous goals in the span of, I don't know, 10 minutes, and they're up 3-1, and it looks absolutely over the other way. And then, uh, you know, my, my older son came down, and we, we started talking about, I forget what it was, we started talking about something, but then Switzerland scores. I was like, oh, no, 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 <laughs> we're going <laughs> to have now. a conversation later, not now. And so, uh, you know, he goes back upstairs and then Switzerland scores again and it's 3 3 at the end of regulation. They go to penalty kicks. Um, yeah, just a wild day. Uh, no, uh, so in the penalty kicks, if, if you're a soccer fan, I understand if you hate penalty kicks as a way of deciding uh, a match. That's, you know, you, you played 120 minutes of soccer and now you're going to go to some completely other way of determining the outcome of a match. But it makes a hero and a goat really quickly. Mm -hmm. So in the penalty shootout, the first nine guys make the penalty. The tenth guy is Kylian Mbappe, which might be the one soccer player that you've heard of, right? Right. The, the French superstar helped them win the World Cup. He gets stoned on the tenth penalty kick, and it's over. Man. And, you know, Swiss keeper is the goat. Uh, sorry, the hero, and Mbappe is the goat. And uh, yeah, it was just it was it, it was it was a soul lifting afternoon as I tried to to tell my kids. Yeah, I mean, think about where we were a year ago, where it was just golf and NASCAR going on. Yep. There was no basketball back yet, no baseball back yet, and it was 
crazy to have that much excitement on my Twitter timeline, which is great. So all in favor of that, it was uh, a lot of fun to observe as an outsider. And I'm excited to watch these games, these matches, I should say, uh, this weekend. We got four big ones coming up. We're going to preview those with Alex Heinert. You can find his game previews for each week up at numberfire.com. He is on Twitter at aheinert, midco sn. Uh, We're going to talk through all four matches, break down those, plus the current futures market. And before we go back through last week, Ed, you were talking before that we started taping about how you've been betting a lot of totals in Euro 2020. Yeah. Why is that? Why have you found success there specifically this year? I think part of it is Rob Pozzola was tweeting about how much money Pinnacle was taking on sides. And I was like, <laughs> uh, okay, uh, let me try to do something else. <laughs> and I uh, wrote some code to take the same numbers that I have and, and look at totals. And uh, yeah, no, I mean, it's it's gone pretty well. It might be small sample size. Sure. Uh, but we'll see. Um, you know, I, I was thinking about talking to Spain. Uh, I have Spain over uh, in their match against Switzerland. My numbers liked it. Uh, I was going to talk about it, but I don't think there's any more value in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I got a much better price a couple days ago. Um, and then... So yeah, just just trying it out. I mean, like I said, it might be noise, but uh, hey. you know, I it's it's also occurred to me that that uh, I really enjoy this international soccer bit, and and I'm gonna keep these numbers updated and keep doing these calculations through World Cup qualifying. You know, I mean, basically through any match that you know that there's no motivational issues for either team, sure, uh, which are the major tournaments and and World Cup qualifying as well. Um, so uh, I'll be probably talking about this more, more. Uh, than I have, which I guess has been nothing. But I will be talking about it more over the next year. But uh, what better motivator for, like, updating your numbers on your site than wanting to bet it yourself individually? So, you know, you I mean, that's a great motivator for me for a lot of stuff. That's why I wanted to build out my NFL win total market. The exact same thing. So uh, our... Our own motivations making our work better, which is always a delight for sure. We're going to get to Alex here in just a bit. But first, we have to go back to two weeks ago. We didn't have a show last week. Got to go back to two weeks. Talk some golf and talk some NASCAR for Covering the Past. Covering the Past. So before we were on break, uh, you were talking golf for the U.S. Open, and I was on NASCAR, and your bet was Joaquin Neiman to finish top 20 at the U.S. Open. And... Old Joaquin gave it a good run. He gained 3.2 strokes off the tee and 3.9 in approach. So the ball striking, as always, with Joaquin Neiman was great. The short game had been getting better recently for him, specifically the putting. He'd been doing really well there, but the short game bit him at the open. He lost one around the green and 1.1 putting. That was the first time he had lost strokes putting since February. So... Just bad luck, whether it be regression, and it's actually not, I think that was a bent grass, uh, but not a bad surface for him either. He finished 31st, so a couple strokes away from the Neiman top 20, and Ed, I think with the ball striking where it was, it was a good bet, just didn't have the, the short game break in your favor there. Yeah, no, it was a little bit of a bummer. Uh, I lost a couple head-to-heads with Neiman uh, uh, before by a couple strokes as well, so you know he'll come through one of these days. Hopefully, uh, because I know both you and Brandon and we've had uh, Colin on. They all seem to be Neiman fans. So for the financial well-being of covering the spread, we have to cheer for (laughs) Joaquin Neiman. We also have to cheer for Joey Logano, uh, who I was on for the podium at Nashville. Started off really well. He actually qualified third for that race, despite not having a ton of speed in practice on Saturday. He just couldn't quite hold that speed the entire race. His average running position was eighth, and you can finish top three with an eighth place average running position. So he had a good car, but he finished 10th, no cashing there. Uh, they are back at a road course this week. I'd be in on Logano again, but they've kind of shortened his odds. He's 12 to 1 for this week, which tells me that uh, people are finally buying into Logano. So if you want to look at some road course numbers this week, Denny Hamlin is. 19 to 1 at some books, which seems outrageous to me. He's 14 at FanDuel Sportsbook. I would consider it there too. But if you can get 19 to 1 in Denny Hamlin, I, I think I'd check that one out. But uh, no Logano podium at Nashville. So we move on to this week. And I'll be talking baseball and covering the future for this week, which we'll get to in just a bit. But first, hey, basketball fans, the NBA Conference Finals about to wrap up. We still have the finals as well. FanDuel is offering a special new user bonus. Place a bet on any single team's money line and 
you will receive exclusive 30 to 1 odds for that wager. All you have to do is head over to the FanDuel Sportsbook, create an account, and take advantage of this amazing NBA playoff odds boost. Maximum bet of $5 must be 21 plus in and present in Colorado, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, or West Virginia. New users only. $10 first deposit required. Max bonus is $150. Restrictions apply. See full terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. In Colorado, 1-800-522-4700. In Iowa, 1-800-BETS-OFF. In Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. For confidential help in Michigan, 1-800-270-7117. In Tennessee, call the red line, 1-800-889-9789. Or in West Virginia, visit 1-800-GAMBLER.net. Let's get set now for the quarterfinals of Euro 2020 by talking with Alex Heinert. Find his work up at numberfire.com and check him out on Twitter at aheinert, midco sn. We're going to talk about all four matches in the futures market for the European Championship. Covering the present. Let's bring Alex Heinert back into covering the spread once again to talk some Euro 2020. And Alex, wild times for you because you just came, became a father for the third time on Monday and yet you are still here talking to us How are you doing? (laughs) I'm doing great, Jim. Thanks for asking. Multitasking. Just trying to keep baby going and keeping the the family moving forward in the right direction. My wife's amazing, which has made all this possible to be able to keep up with an international soccer tournament while she's been nine months pregnant and dealing with two toddlers as well. But it's it's been a ton of fun, and I'm really happy to be joining you. And happy to announce that that, mom and baby are both doing great now a couple days in. Well, fantastic. Congratulations. And you said that you and your wife were actually watching matches the morning after in the hospital as well? <laughs> the more, Yeah, the day of. So it worked out great. Um, our son Henry was born on Monday, and this was the same day. This is the, the craziest day, really, in <laughs> European football championship history, where you had Spain and Croatia in the morning and France and, and the Swiss in the afternoon. And uh, the little guy was nice. He waited till about 6 o'clock Central Time that night to be born. So we got a chance <laughs> to get through penalties with France and Switzerland before we decided to arrive. And then, yeah, it was, it was great to have something on in the background as we were just kind of waiting and hanging out and and ready to go and getting ready for labor. So uh, good timing on his part for sure. Well, it is good to know he is considerate already in this young age. He is considerate, considerate of you and your time. But again, congratulations. I am glad here. Everyone is doing well. And you mentioned that you've been able to pay attention throughout all this. Has it been weird for you to juggle everything going on? But also like, it feels like this has been kind of a crazy tournament so far. Yeah, it's been a really fun tournament. I think the, the biggest thing for me, at least watching it, is just it's been so long since we've had one of these. I mean, we yeah. haven't had a major international soccer tournament since the Women's World Cup of 2019, you know, the Men's World Cup of 2018. Normally, these things happen every summer. And so we missed, obviously, it, it, it all last year. And it's just been fun. I mean, great drama, really, from the start. A very emotional tournament when you factor in Denmark and the storyline with right. Christian Eriksen, which we're going to get to. But the games themselves have been outstanding, nearly three goals per match. Uh, the, the Euros are unique where you've got 24 teams, so you get the top two teams in each group, plus the four best third place teams advance. So there doesn't always involve a lot of jeopardy in the group stage matches. You can kind of feel like, well, the, the good teams are all going through for sure. And even some of the mediocre teams are going to make it as well to the knockout stages. But we had great drama, really, at the end of the group stages and certainly in the knockout rounds. I mean, unbelievable round of 16 matches up and down, and, and it's produced a few surprises as well. So let's talk about some of those surprises. And I want to start things off here broad, Alex, and we'll talk about specific teams in a second. But you've been doing these game previews for number fire throughout the tournament, and obviously, to start things off, you need some sort of prior going in, what you're expecting to happen for the tournament as a whole. What has, what has been different from your expectation going in for the tournament as a whole from what you thought initially? Well, I think through the group stage, we didn't see a ton of major shocks. A lot of the favorites progressed, almost all the favorites really progressed to the knockout round. Again, of the 16 teams that advanced uh, in the little bracket that I filled out beforehand, like 14 teams that I expected to make it did and, and made it through without a lot of sweating, nervous energy at the very end. Turkey really was the only surprise, who a lot of people picked maybe as a dark horse to win the whole thing. And they didn't win a single match or collect a single point in Group A and looked pretty poor. But everything else really played out according to form. Once we got to the round of 16, though, it became a coin flip. And a lot of these knockout games are. Again, it's 90 minutes and anything can happen in in low-scoring events like soccer. 
And of the eight games, really only five of the favorites made it through. And we had three pretty big upsets with the Czech Republic beating the Dutch. We have, you know, Ukraine beating Sweden, which wasn't a massive upset, but still Sweden had won their group. That was a bit of a surprise as poorly as Ukraine had looked in the group stage. Uh, and then now I'm blanking as all these matches go through. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Who was the other one? Switzerland, I'm sorry, gosh, the biggest upset of all, Switzerland beating the pre-tournament yep. favorites, France, which was a huge upset. So, and there were a couple that also could have kind of gone either way. When you look at extra time and four of the matches, Austria nearly beating Italy, who had looked like the best team in the tournament. So it was just a little reminder that if you were heavy on the favorites in the group stage, that strategy didn't necessarily pay off when you got to the knockout rounds. And we'll see now if that will carry on as we go into the quarterfinals and beyond. Yeah, absolutely. So we uh, we have eight teams left in the field. Um, so which one are kind of exceeding your pre-tournament expectations and, and which ones do you expect some regression for? Well, I think if you looked pre-tournament, I mean, you could really break it down into tiers. And we already mentioned, you know, France was obviously in that top tier as the pre-tournament favorite. Belgium was certainly there. Italy was certainly there. Those two have made it onto the quarterfinals. Now they're going to play each other. So one of those big favorites is going to get knocked off. England was in that top tier as well. And then the rest of these teams now that we have left, Denmark was the number 10 team in the FIFA rankings. So they were expected to compete and maybe be a dark horse in this tournament, but they were probably in a tier below that top group. And then you look at a team like the Swiss who were in the teens, but most people expected them to maybe make the round of 16 and then immediately get bounced by one of the big dogs. So the fact they've moved on is a big surprise. The Czech Republic was the 40th ranked team in the world coming in. And I think people thought, you know, they've got some good players. They've got some Premier League players and Thomas Suchek of West Ham and Patrick Schick is a well-known striker from the Bundesliga who plays for Bayern Leverkusen. But I don't think people expected them to make it to the quarterfinals. And now they've got a great chance to maybe progress a little bit farther. Uh, the Ukraine as well. I mean, that's a team that not, not a lot of people expected much of and they didn't look great in the group stage. And here they are now with a shot against England at a neutral site. So it's it's hard to say who we think is going to get too much farther out of that group because, again, on paper, and if you look statistically, the favorites should have the edge in these quarterfinal games. And you would kind of think the road is going to come to an end for the Swiss and for the Czechs and for Ukraine. But as the round of 16 proved, you just have no idea. You never know when, when situations like this pop up. So we're going to find out over this weekend who's going to keep moving on and who will keep that Cinderella dream alive going here in Euro 2020 being played in 2021. Well, I'm curious, how much has the round of 16 kind of shaken your confidence level in trying to predict these matches? If there's been that much chaos there, I feel like it's hard to expect things to stable out, especially if you've seen some of the teams you would have expected to roll in the quarterfinals no longer in the field. It certainly gives you pause. Uh, it makes you, <laughs> makes you kind of question the the data that you've compiled a little bit. I know the even the eye test, too. I mean, soccer... You know, there just aren't a ton of metrics that you can really look at and say, okay, this is this is a great predicator of success. Even like expected goals, which has become a much more common thing to look at and say, okay, what would maybe you didn't get lucky on the day, but what were you expected to score? What chances did you create? What chances did you concede at the other end? Even expected goals hasn't really meant much in this tournament. Um, and, and you look at teams that have been really good in the group stage and then just didn't show up in the round of 16. So when you look and you break things down and even I test wise, you think, well, the Swiss looked so bad against Italy. I mean, that's been the best team they've played before. You know, they're going to get killed by France. And that obviously wasn't the case. They ended up winning in penalties and played really well and could have won that game outright. Um, Ed, you were talking, I mean, you were watching that match and they're up one nothing and have a penalty kick and are ready to go up yep. two nothing. And and all of a sudden now they're down three one, but then they fight back and then they force yep. extra time. You just don't know. And so, you know, looking at this, on paper, all of these matchups feature, I mean, at least one one team that's that's fairly favored. You could probably call the Czech Republic and, and Denmark maybe a little bit more of a coin flip, but you would expect Spain to go through. You would expect Italy to as well with Belgium being so banged up. You would expect the Danes to move on. And same thing with England. But <laughs> the confidence level is not super high. And the odds, because the odds are what they are, that sort of reflects maybe the direction you should go and looking toward, well, it's close this is an unpredictable tournament. Maybe just taking where the best value is, is the best way to move forward. If you want to back someone in these matches. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, 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 yeah, I do think that is definitely the approach, like looking at prices, uh, especially since uh, I've seen some pretty weird ones uh, on some of the books uh, these past couple of days. Uh, let's start with the two Friday matches. Uh, we have Switzerland versus Spain. Uh, no, actually, no, let's start with Belgium versus Italy. These are two teams that really 
could meet, I mean, are really, you could think of them as meeting in the final. Uh, we obviously have some huge injury situations with, uh, looks like unlikely that Kevin De Bruyne and Eden Hazard will play for Belgium. Let's talk about that game. What do you see? Well, it's a great matchup. And obviously, if those two players were healthy, this becomes a, a true coin flip because you've got Belgium as the world number one with this golden generation that is coming off a third place finish at the 2018 World Cup. And they've been gearing towards this for a, for a while now, really, like they have never won a major international trophy. And this is the group that is talented enough and cohesive enough to get it done. But they've, their two best players, essentially, outside of Romelu Lukaku, who maybe is their best informed player right now, are right. both going to probably miss this game. De Bruyne with that ankle injury that he suffered in their round of 16 match against Portugal. And then Eden Hazard, who didn't start the tournament. And De Bruyne didn't either, by the way, because he had broken his face yep. in the Champions League final against Chelsea. <laughs> But Hazard had been hurt for much of the year with Real Madrid. He was slowly working his way back into form in this tournament and looked really good the previous two matches. But he goes out at the end of that game in the round of 16 with the hamstring pull, it looked like. So the fact that those two guys are out now gives a big edge to Italy. Italy have never lost to Belgium in a competitive match. They are on a 31-game unbeaten streak. They've only allowed one goal, one, in their last 12 competitive matches, which is crazy. And that was, of course, last game against Austria. And that was a late last pass uh, goal in extra time to make that game two to one. But it, all the numbers would say Italy is going to be the team to move on here. They've become kind of the hot favorites. They looked great in the group stage. A lot of those games are played at home, though. And that's kind of one of the other wrinkles about this tournament is that in the group stage, a lot of the favorites were playing in front of home crowds, even if they weren't full stadiums. Certainly the Danes, certainly the Dutch, obviously Italy, England. Germany to a lesser extent, but they're all playing at home. And now here they've come to the knockout stages. And outside of England, everybody's on the road all of a sudden. So even though Italy won't be playing in Rome in front of their crowd at the Stadio Olimpico, based on Belgium's recent struggles with injury, they probably are the pick. But it should be noted, Belgium was without Eden Hazard and Kevin De Bruyne for their opener against Russia. And they looked pretty good in that match yeah. and won that game. I believe 3-0 going away. And yeah, but the, they, that yeah. was Russia. So <laughs> that was Russia. Exactly. That was Russia. Yeah. Who, so my you know, I I really like this Belgium team. They're like the top team by my numbers, uh uh that I run. And you obviously had issues because you didn't know whether Hazard and De Bruyne would play. And then you know, they got in that second game against Denmark, and Denmark really took it to them and really outplayed them for most of the first half. Uh, they put De Bruyne in in the second half. He uh, is just magical in scoring, uh, orchestrating the first goal and then scoring the second goal. And then Hazard's actually playing. And so I actually have some Belgian futures because of that. Um, I, I, I Just believing in my numbers and seeing that those guys were out on the field and just seeing how talented they are on the offensive side of the ball. And uh, I think a lot of people would agree that, you know, fully healthy, like, that's the best offensive team in this tournament. But of course, now the injury issues. Um, you know, I think I think they're really relying on you know a somewhat old defense to kind of hold down Italy, and then maybe a mo moment of magic from Lukaku. Um, but I, I think the markets have it right, and 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 you know my numbers are going to be off because of those pretty big big injuries. Yeah, and there's Plus, I think that's it. There's there's value. I mean, this is a team that is really good and deep, and it's not like they're going to be throwing on guys who are playing in the sure. second tier of some of these leagues. I mean, they're throwing on Yannick Carrasco and Dries Mertens, who's one of the better players in Italy, to replace those two guys. So the fact that they're plus 240 in this game, it, it's conceivable, certainly, that they can hang with Italy. They've only allowed one goal all tournament. Thibaut Courtois is great in goal. It's not out of the question. I mean, this is a really talented team. But again, you'd feel a lot better about it if they had De Bruyne and Hazard in this game. Massive testament to them to have it be competitive despite missing those two guys. Let's talk Switzerland, Spain. Uh, Spain, one of the more favored teams as you alluded to before. Uh, what are you seeing for this one, the other game on Friday? This is so this Spain team, and let's let's start there. Spain entering this tournament was, you know, a top 10 team in FIFA. Obviously, they, you know, not too far removed from winning the Euros in 2008, 2012, and with the World Cup championship sandwiched in between. That generation, of course, is retired now, and this is a new group of Spanish players. And this team was kind of in a mess entering these European championships with Sergio Busquets, their captain, testing positive for COVID right before the tournament. The entire team had to isolate. They were training individually. The entire team was vaccinated a day before the tournament was going to kick off by the Spanish army. Like just a lot of different stuff going on within that group that kind of made you question a little bit, like, how how's this going to go when they actually start playing? <laughs> And then they drew against Sweden when they had 85% possession. And I don't know how many, I mean, 
chance after chance after chance that they just couldn't quite convert. And then they drew against Poland in the next round. And it just seemed like this is a team that's just going to fail. The offense isn't there. They don't have any confidence ahead of goal. And now in the last two matches, they've scored 10 goals. They scored five against Slovakia, who was pretty well, terrible, and then put five up against Croatia and obviously an extra time match. And it seems like they've started to figure things out. Go ahead, Ed. I was just going to say, it's actually 11 goals if you count the 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 goof by their keeper, right? So Sure. I mean, on the own goal. But yeah, yeah it's, been, it's been an explosion. Yeah. So now, I mean, you have to look at this team in a completely different light. And this is a Spanish team that... Again, for all the talk about how they couldn't score, again, now they lead the tournament in that metric. And they've been pretty good defensively outside of that crazy final 10 minutes in, against Croatia in the round of 16. They've been pretty solid. And so, I mean, this is a team that leads the tournament in possession. They lead the tournament in shots on goal. They lead the tournament in shot attempts. They're also joint leaders in fewest shots per game allowed. So they've been, as they always do, in control of the ball from start to finish in these games and mostly in control of the match. And now they get a Swiss team who is kind of on the opposite end. The numbers aren't very kind to Switzerland. Remember, they were blown out 3 nothing by Italy in the second game of their group. Obviously, they had a great morale-boosting, incredible win against France to get them into the quarterfinals of any major tournament for the first time in their history. Just at first blood. And now they're, but again, the Swiss are missing their captain now. Granite Jacques is out because of yellow card accumulation. So they lose an Arsenal midfielder from the heart of that team and one of their big motivational leaders who was so key in winning that game against France. They've gotten some good contributions from guys that they've maybe relied upon in the past, like Severovic up top, who just is a big striker that just can't seem to score. But then he had, he had a huge goal against France and now has three for the tournament. You know, Jordan Security has been playing well. So they, they're obviously going to have a shot in this game. But for them, it's going to be how well can we defend? Can we hit Spain on the counter? And can we get lucky against the team that we only have one competitive win against in our history? Albeit that was at a World Cup and that was in 2010, the last time they played in a competitive match. They won one nothing. The only time Spain lost in that tournament in South Africa before Spain went on to win the whole thing. So, again, on paper, numbers wise, should be an easy Spain victory. But these games aren't played on paper, as we've seen over the course yep. of this tournament. Uh, let's head over to uh, what I'm calling the England side of the bracket. Uh, <laughs> they uh, they play Ukraine. Uh, I mean, basically, what, Tuesday was the best possible outcome for England in, in beating the Germans and then getting Ukraine in, instead of Sweden. Not that they wouldn't have been favored against Sweden. They would have. Um, but uh, and uh, they, they are actually away from home for the first time uh, in this entire tournament and will be for the first time. Uh, even if they make it to the final, because the last two, last three games are are all in London. So what what are you seeing in this game? Again, this is another one. This is obviously the one that has the biggest gap in odds. I think Ukraine is plus 700 right now for this match. England is a minus 260. I mean, Ukraine is a huge underdog coming in. And they were the, again, for good reason, based on what we've seen in this tournament, this was a Ukraine team that barely got in. They needed help on the last day from Sweden to sneak in as the last place or the, the lowest ranking third place team to make it. So they were number 16 of 16 in the round of 16. But they're talented. They've got some game changing type players with Zinchenko, who's a Man City left back, who's been playing in midfield for this team over the course of the tournament. Um, Yarmolenko for West Ham has been great. Obviously, he has one thing that he does really well, but he's got one of the best left foot feet one of the best left feet in the world and we've seen that over the course of this tournament and they've been able to, to make things happen out of moments of magic and we saw that against sweden again a last gasp winner in the what the 121st minute of the game the latest game winning goal in euro history they looked awful against austria in a game they really needed to win the final game of the group stage to move on and i think that sort of threw everybody off their scent they didn't play great against north macedonia they won two nothing in that game and against the Dutch, their first game, they won. They, they lost three to two. They had a great comeback in that game, but they didn't really do much outside of the two goals that they scored in that game. So I think most people expected them to fall out to Sweden. Didn't work out that way. Now they get England. And there's a little whiff among some people of, is this 2016 England against Iceland all over again, where England might be overlooking this team and already kind of penciling themselves in to the next rounds. However, this England team has actually looked good in this tournament. And that 2016 version really did not over the course of their group stage. And so the, the fact that England has not conceded a single goal in this tournament, they're the only team to do so, so far. They have not scored a ton, but they've gotten contributions now from Raheem Sterling, who's got three of their goals. Harry Kane finally scored. That's got to give them a little bit of a boost. And it just feels like Gareth Southgate has figured out the right buttons to push for this team. And they are going to play pragmatic. 
They are not going to give up a lot at the opposite ends. Ukraine is a team that is sort of used to seeding possession and then, again, trying to get the ball to their playmakers and make something happen in a counterattack situation or in a set piece. But England, I think, are going to be prepared for that. And even though they'll be playing in Rome and not at Wembley, there's a reason why England is, is this big of a favorite to move on, not just in this game, but to go all the way in this tournament. There are some concerns, of course, and you wish they had scored maybe just a little bit more in a group that really wasn't all that impressive. But in this matchup with all of their talents and, and the fact that they're defensively solid, and, and you go back to this, defensive solidity typically equals results in these big tournaments. It's been proven over the years. This is the best defensive team, at least on paper, here at these Euros. They should have a great chance to move on. So if they move on, they'd face either Denmark or the Czech Republic. And you mentioned that this is kind of the toss-up of this round. Uh, Denmark right now plus 110, Czech Republic plus 280. What's your read on this match overall? Well, this is a case where you've got a little bit like the Spain-Switzerland game, where you've got a Denmark team that, through, for, for obvious reasons, again, their star player Christian Eriksen has a cardiac arrest on fields in the middle of their first match of the tournament against Finland. That threw their tournament into chaos. And again, if you watch that match, I mean, you, just as a spectator watching on TV, that was emotionally difficult, you know, to yeah. see someone who you think, it, what what is happening with this person's life? And for his teammates to be on the field with him, guys that have played with him since he was probably, you know, six, seven, eight years old. I mean, guys that know him intimately, that's got to be difficult to overcome. And so it was no surprise they lose to Finland once that match was resumed later in the evening after Christian was was deemed okay and was back in hospital. And then they go out the next match and they got to play Belgium. And and they, as Ed mentioned, spirited game against Belgium. They gave them everything they had. They score early. But there was a Belgium team in full flow and they lose 2-1. And then the last two matches, they have just turned it on and they look like a different team. They scored four against Russia in one of the best games of the tournament. I mean, emotionally and, and just a thrilling game where... You just willed that team to win and to find a way. And they did in front of their home crowd. Uh, and so they scored four in that match. And then they put up four in their last match, the round of 16 game against Wales. And they looked fantastic in that game. And they just seem to be this team of destiny. Uh, a lot like they were in 1992 when they won the whole thing as a team that hadn't even qualified for the tournament, but, that, but got called into action because Yugoslavia had to pull out because their country was going through a, not a civil war, but they were splitting essentially. This was the velvet divorce that was happening. Denmark gets called in at the last minute and they end up winning the whole thing. There's a whiff of that with this Danish team. And now they get the Czechs who have been pretty good at the back. They've only allowed two goals all tournament, um, one to Croatia and, and one to England. The Czech Republic was really benefited from a red card midway through their round of six game against, 16 game against the Dutch, but they still won that game convincingly. One of the areas where I think this game might be swung. So the Czechs have had success through the air. Um, Patrick Schick is a big striker. They've got a lot of big defensemen. They're good at set pieces. That's how they scored their first goal against the Dutch. They've used that to their advantage over the course of this tournament. However, if you look at some of the metrics about aerials one and just sheer height across the, the lineup, the Danes are actually better than the Czechs are in the air. And so given the momentum the Danish are going to have going into this match and the fact that they're probably a better team top to bottom, you think maybe, even though this is a little more even, you think, Dane, the, the favorites will probably move on based on some of those things. But if you're ever going to look at a draw, this certainly could be it, where both teams might stick in and just see how this plays out in a very tight, sort of a nil-nil, 1-1 -nil, type game that might have to go into extra time. Yeah, I'm actually a pretty big fan of Denmark. My numbers really like them. I think they played really well after the Finland game. You look at the talent they have on that side, even without Ericsson, uh it's pretty overwhelming. So, um, but let's talk about England. I mean, there's a reason I call it the England side of the bracket um, <laughs> because they don't get Spain, Belgium, or Italy. Uh, they're currently the favorite at plus 175. Semifinals and finals are at Wembley. Do you like that number, or is there anything else in, in the out, outright number, outright market that you're looking at right now? Well, it certainly seems like that that would be the team who's the obvious choice, I mean, to be able to go all the way. And the, the certainly road lines up pretty well. They obviously already, if, if, for example, they get through Ukraine, they would either play a Czech team who they beat and, and beat pretty convincingly, even though it was only one nothing. They looked good in that match in the group stage. Or uh, against the Denmark team that, again, at this point in the tournament, maybe you're kind of running on emotional fumes. It's been such a crazy month for them. England would be the pick, certainly, in that contest as well. But I think, again, if you're looking at value and you're thinking about other teams who at least have a shot to do something, we talked about Spain, how they're hot right now. They have a tough road, of course, but you'd expect them to at least make it to the semis with the win against the Swiss and then maybe a tough matchup, certainly, against Italy or Belgium. 
you know, Italy at plus 430 at the moment looks good. I, I, you, we, we talked a lot about Belgium and how that is a team that on paper is a lot better than a plus 650 to win the whole thing. And if you wanted something of value, let's say, for example, that Belgium can find a way to get past Italy here in the quarterfinals. Now they get another handful of days to get De Bruyne and Hazard back. You'd liken their chance against Spain with a full team. And then you'd probably like a chance, their chances against England if it works out that way. They beat England in that third place game in 2018 in the World Cup. Belgium is the most talented team in this tournament when fully fit. And right now they're the fourth favorite to win the whole thing. Yeah. That to me would be if you wanted to make, again, understanding that they could certainly crash out this next round. They're not at full strength. And we talked about all the reasons why Italy are favorites in that game. But if you wanted value, that's a team that you should certainly look at to at least think about investing yeah. in moving forward. No, I mean, I completely agree with that. I mean, the Belgium odds have been pretty interesting because they didn't really move after De Bruyne and Hazard were playing in that second game. And that's when I grabbed some stuff. And then they actually moved. I, I got it at plus 650. I think I hit it again at plus 700. And then they end, you know, then they end up on the side of death in the round of 16. And I think the odds went like way, way up. I mean, I don't know if they were 10, 9 to 1 or something like that. So it's been interesting. And then you win a game, uh, you know, pretty not their best game against Portugal, but they got through and now their odds are back to plus 650. Um, yeah, you just if, if you're doing that, you're hoping they're healthy, which they're not right now. So we'll see, <laughs> we'll see how that goes. It's not just the outrights. We got a lot of other markets here for uh, the rest of the of Euro 2020. We got top score. We got top scoring team, all that stuff. Alex, any value for you in those markets right now? Well, the golden boot one is always fun. I mean, Cristiano Ronaldo right now is, is the favorite. and He's leading the way with five goals, but obviously he's done. Portugal got bounced in the round of 16. Patrick Schick, who we talked about in the Czech Republic, has four. But again, you're sort of projecting them to maybe lose here this next round. So that, that makes you think, who, who's next in line? And there are a number of guys that we project to move ahead that have scored three. And the odds are pretty good on some of those guys. I mean, the next group would be Romelu Lukaku and Raheem Sterling of Belgium and England, respectively. And then you look at Harry Kane, who's like 20 to one right now. And Kane's only scored once. But if you really want to value play, and anytime you look at these sorts of sorts of deals, you want to find out who's taking the penalties for these teams and how long are these teams going to be playing. Yeah. And if, if you think about England maybe playing three more games, Kane takes the penalties for the three Lions. And that's why he was the favorite to win the Golden Boot going in. Again, you don't love how he's played so far. He's not looked great. It's not been pretty. But this is a guy who is going to get opportunity. He's going to be in the starting lineup as their number nine for every match that they play. So if you really want to, you know, try something that's a little more off the table at 20 to one, Harry Kane would be a decent option, even though he's really got to score. He's got to average more than a goal per game over the final three if they make it all the way. I mean, to me, we just talked about Belgium. Lukaku would be a great pick here. Again, all he's got to do is score twice and he equals Ronaldo. And if they can make a little bit of a run, he's the third, you know, he's right now third right now in terms of odds. That's not the worst idea. If you really wanted to move down the list, Spain has a chance to make the final. And if you if you want to play it out and think, well, maybe Italy and Belgium will really beat each other up in that quarterfinal match. Spain moves on past Switzerland pretty easily. They get a banged up Italy or Belgium in the semis and they move on to the championship. Maybe Ferran Torres, who scored a couple of times. Maybe Alvaro Morata, who scored twice. Maybe those would be decent options um, at 50 to 1 or whatever they are right now. But Spain, to me, has always been like a running back by committee where you just don't know who's <laughs> going to score. They've scored 11 goals again in this tournament, but six different guys have scored and nobody has scored more than two. So there's a there's a lot more dart throwing when it comes to those guys. But the upside's there, really high ceiling for that Spanish team that will face a Swiss team that has given up eight goals in this tournament, the joint most of anybody. Goals will probably flow in that quarterfinal match and you hope they flow for your guy if you pick right. either Murata or Pedri yeah. or Sarabi or any of those guys who are really far down the list. No, I like that. I mean, even coming into this tournament, Spain was the second best offensive team when when I look at numbers over the past four and a half years. So uh, they have guys that can score. You just hope, like you said, it's your guy. <laughs> I love the thought process of any market that requires some assumptions and some correlated stuff like that. So uh, all on board for that. That is Alex Heinert. Make sure you check him out on numberfire.com. Follow him on Twitter as well at a Heinert Midco SN. Alex, congratulations once again on uh, the new sun. We appreciate the time today. Go get some sleep if you can and uh, good luck and have fun watching the matches this weekend. No, thanks so much. Thanks, Jim. I appreciate you guys. Take care. Thank you. Covering the future.
Big thank you one more time to Alex Heiner for swinging by and breaking down this weekend's matches for Euro 2020. And Ed, when we were talking to Alex, you mentioned Denmark and a team that it sounds like your numbers like. They face the Czech Republic for this week. What are you seeing for that that match? Yeah, I mean, I, as I mentioned before, like, you know, Denmark, they, they clearly didn't play well in the first game. They lose Ericsson. Uh, they uh, they lose to, I, I believe it was Finland. But they've actually played really well since then. Um, they put a ton of pressure on Belgium. They were clearly the better side for a, a big portion of that match before um, Belgium brought in their stars and, and they were able to convert. Uh, really, really impressive in dispatching with a, a good Wales team in, in the round of 16. My numbers really like them. My numbers really also do not like the Czech Republic. <laughs> And uh, from what I've seen of them in this tournament, especially versus England, uh, they're they're not particularly good. So um, I do think there's a little bit of value uh, in Denmark. Uh, my numbers give them a 58 percent chance to win in regulation. Uh, I believe a price you can get right now at FanDuel, I think, was like plus 105 uh, for for that. So. You know, when you think about Denmark, the, the narrative is they lost their best player, and, and Christian Eriksen is is their best player. Uh, but but at, you know, Mike Goodman was on my podcast. He's a soccer analytics expert. He's a senior soccer editor over at CBS, and he he talked about well, if if you just kind of close your eyes and look at the rest of this roster, there's a lot of players that play on high end club teams uh, on this Denmark roster, and it's not a surprise that they were playing well. And um, I I don't see. I don't see the Czech Republic advancing. I, I think Denmark, uh, I really like them to, to get by. And, and then we'll see what they can do against England at Wembley. So you have Denmark plus 110 versus the Czech Republic here. That's the the way you're leaning? Oh, yeah, for sure. I, yeah, I, I, I bet that. I forget what price I got. But, like, yeah, um, you know, my numbers have it at 58%. Uh, all my numbers are posted at thepowerrank.com. So you should be able to find that on the blog. And uh, you can check out my international soccer rankings as well. Okay, find those over at thepowerrank.com. And uh, I guess we are all in on Denmark for this weekend, both Alex and you leaning towards them. For my cover of the future, I want to talk some baseball. I have been staying out of the World Series market because I had a Padres ticket, and it seemed like either they or the Dodgers were just going to slug it out in the NL, and then whoever won there would win the whole thing. That's what my number said preseason. Hasn't quite played out that way for San Diego thus far, but I've been staying away from that market as a result of that. It seems now, though, like the Astros are entering that top tier in baseball, and I like them at plus 650 to win the World Series right now. I like the Astros to win the West, the American League West, before the season, but I was questioning their upside because of their pitching. The staff had a lot of question marks in the starting rotation, I didn't know if they would compete in the playoff format because pitching matters so much there, and I was skeptical, but they've been really good there recently, and they've been good even with the sticky stuff discussion going on. We've seen guys like Jose Urquidy, who just went on the injured list, but before that, getting hurt, was pitching really well. That changeup movement was back for him. I was super encouraged by what he was doing previously. He did go on the IL like yesterday, but it doesn't sound like a season ender for him with his shoulder. Uh, I would expect him back at some point and to pitch pretty well. But with Luis Garcia and Frember Valdez, really good peripheral numbers for them. So I have fewer concerns about the pitching now than I had before. And the offense is just lethal. So if they can get decent pitching they're going to be a force. Their active roster leads the league in WRC Plus against both righties and lefties. Overall, they have a 123 WRC Plus. Nobody else in baseball is higher than 113. It's a massive gap. So I would bet that this Houston team, at some point before the trade deadline, bolsters their pitching staff. And if they do that, they could go back to being an unstoppable team. I could just go with the American League market on this team, but I think there is good value on them to, because they've been playing so well, be in the same tier as the Dodgers and the Padres. So I actually do think that the best market for the Astros right now is to check out the outright market for the World Series, plus 650 over at FanDuel Sportsbook. I do like Houston there, and I think that they are a team we'll be talking a lot about as we get closer to October. Ed, I know you've got some baseball stuff as well. What are your numbers saying about Houston right now? Yeah, I mean, they love Houston. Uh, when you look at uh, base runs, or essentially expected runs, runs stripping out the cluster luck uh, and adjusting for opponent, I mean, Houston's almost a run and a half better than the average MLB team, and that's a lot, right? So, yeah. like, um, you know, the Dodgers are like 1.1 run 
better than the average MLB team. So, yeah, I mean, it clearly likes Houston as well. And, uh, yeah, sports what you're saying. So we are all in on Denmark, all in on Houston, and we'll see how things break there for sure. That is all that we have here for today on Covering the Spread. Big thank you once again to Alex Heinert. Check him out on Twitter at Heinert Midco SN and check out his his previews for Euro 2020 up on numberfire.com. Thank you to Alex and congratulations to him and his wife once again for the birth of their son. Ed, what is going on for you this week over at the Power Rank? Yeah, a ton of stuff. Uh, sign up for my free email newsletter, uh, data-driven betting information. Check that out at thepowerrank.com. I had Mike Goodman, uh, senior soccer editor at CBS and co-host of the Double Pivot podcast. Basically one of the best people to, in the world to talk about uh, Euro and soccer analytics. So we did that over at the Football Analytics Show. Uh, check that out. And then uh, a lot of Euro predictions over on my site at thepowerrank.com. I definitely have all of your numbers for quarterfinals. Uh, and then I actually talked about uh, England versus Ukraine in a separate post. So just check out the blog over at thepowerrank.com. And the podcast is the Football Analytics Show. Search for that wherever you get your podcasts. Ed is on Twitter. I am or at the Power Rank. I am at Jim Sanis, J I M S A N N E S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Big thank you to Calvin Theobald, our video producer, for running the video side of things here today. Thank you, Cal, as always. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. Good luck to you with your bets for Euro 2020. Enjoy the matches this weekend. We'll talk to you all once again next week. This has been covering the spread right Right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. Aaron Dolan here. Thanks for watching and make sure you click below on that subscribe button for more great FanDuel content and check out some of our latest uploads and playlists right over here.